This conference will now be recorded. Uh, tumor classification. Before we uh, go through this briefly, so I just want you to have a very clear concept because in the exam they will give you a description and then they will ask you that what type of cancer is this one. Okay. So let's go co cover them one by one. So hematomas, uh, these are congenital malformations which look like tumors and they are present at birth and then they grow and then with passage of time they will regress also. Angioma is the commonest of such hematomas and uh, it is composed of capillary network and blood spaces. It usually involves liver, lung, bone and nerve. Then your patient can have, uh, I won't say patient, a person can have bromangioma. Here there will be arteriovenous connections and these are common in the limbs. Second type of tumors can be mesenchymal or the connective tissue tumors and there are many examples. There can be fibroma. Fibroma is composed of fibroblasts and uh, when it is a fibroma, it will be very hard. They will tell you that there is an ovarian tumor which is very hard, which is it seems hard and when you will try to cut it, it will as if you are cutting a potato. So it will be so hard. Your answer is fibroma. Then there can be uh, mesenchymal tumors which are involving the nerve cells. We call them neurofibromatosis. It can involve any organ. Okay. So then there can be, because these are the nerves, nerves are going everywhere. So from head to toe, any area can be involved. But along the nerve lines, mostly they will, they will be along the sympathetic trunks. Okay. Then there can be multiple myxoma and there will be plenty of mucin secretion. Synovioma, you know, this is the synovial membrane. It is covering the inner surface of the synovial joints, like um, knee joints hip joints, shoulder joint. So you can understand that if there is synovioma, then it will decrease movement. There can be desmoid tumors. Uh, these are present in the rectus sheath. These are multiple tumors and they are hard tumors. If somebody has a desmoid tumor, you will see that the, uh, you can see a large incision in the abdomen. It will be like a diagonal long shape and why it will be long because they will have to remove the whole muscle lipoma fat cells in the subcutaneous tissue and this one will be encapsulated and the capsule will be um, fat will be contained in the capsule they they are soft but they look bad that's why people will try to get rid of them they can be small or they can these lipomas can be very small where they will not cause any problem or they can be very large like they can be along the whole arm, whole foot can be anywhere. Okay. So they will have a, the surgeon will have to remove it. Myomas are important for you. They are composed of smooth muscle. Um, so they are benign, present in the uterus, but they can also occur in the gut, in the skin. And uh, these fibroids, sometimes they can cause polycythemia also and just 0.5% they can be malignant. Regarding malignancy, um, you know, th this is the chance that a benign myoma, it will transform into a malignant one. Just 0.5% chance, okay. Most of the tumors, which are like uh, malignant, like leomyosarcoma, they will appear as a new growth, okay. So they will be retroperitoneal, and they are malignant and they can cause unexplained fever. So, and they will grow very rapidly. And then the size will grow suddenly. It will cause pressure symptoms because they are very big. Osteoma, uh, it is the tumor in the bone. It is commonly seen in the wall. There can be rhabdomyoma, like a benign tumor of the striated muscles. It is rare. And usually it will involve, but if it occurs in the children, it can be malignant. Osteosarcomas, these are benign tumors, these are malignant tumors of the bone, and they spread through the blood, blood vessels, and they involve the young age, and they can be a very serious issue. 
and uh, two types are there but osteosarcoma can be ewing carcinoma but they will not ask you in detail they will just ask you about these things that uh, this is malignant or this is benign third type of tumors they can be so these are all connective tissue tumor and you know the connective tissue includes all a large variety of tissues right connective tissue can form viscera it can form muscles bones nerves all of these are connective tissues so you can see a large variety and then there's epithelial tumors and they can be of different types depending upon the type of epithelium and the organ they are lining papilloma they are benign they can be in the skin in the urinary tract in the git for example there can be villus papilloma of the rectum and then it can cause dehydration it can cause low potassium and cause alkalosis then among these papillomas warts these are the most common type of tumors papillomas and they will appear because of the human papilloma virus can they can occur and um, then warts you know that they will be seen on the feet and uh, it can be anywhere but mostly on the feet of a person and then uh, you can leave them or you can uh, get them treated like excision they will put aspirin powder and then they will take out the bones can be planted planter warts are the most common one but they can be anywhere in the body adenoma adenoma is a benign epithelium tumor of the glands for example familial polyposis coli it may form cysts which can be serous or mucinous it can contain a serous material or a slightly thicker mu mucus can be there and uh, the, then this new mucin is neutral and it is stained with pass then melanoma this is common in the females in the reproductive age group and it develops from the melanocytes and uh, it will start at the base of the epidermis and they will take origin original is origin is from the neural crest cells they can produce tyrosine and my tyrosine it will be changed into the melanin you know that that is a, from phenylalanine ty tyrosine and from tyrosine melanin will be formed so uh, this mason fountain stain it can stain the melanin then uh, these there can be you know moles okay, they can be melanomas or they can be moles so the moles they can be benign and this may be a nevus at the epidermis or at the junction and the nevus which penetrates the epidermis then sometimes they can be malignant. So 70% on top of the benign or de novo, they may affect even heart or GIT blood and they will spread through the blood and the lymphatics. So the treatment will be excision. So tissue hyperpigmentation can also occur in pregnancy, in Addison's disease, in hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease. In cases of Wilson disease, there will be melanosis coli. Uh, pigmentation in the colonic mucosa after long standing use of the laxatives like if the patient is taking phenolphthalein like those people who have uh, bulimia nervosa that is a type of eating disorder then they can develop a dark pigmentation in the gut another condition can be incontinentia pigmenti this is the here the epidermis it will affect the female and only as male fetus will die and uh, there will be increased pigmentation and uh, that is more common but sometimes they can be hyperpigmentation and they can involve eye teeth and the cns regarding uh, carcinoma carcinoma means malignant tumors so most common ones are squamous cell carcinoma they arise from the stratified squamous epithelium or they can occur because of the metaplasia uh, like in case of the case of lung if the person is smoking then they can develop bronchogenic carcinoma how they will develop because the respiratory epithelium which is mucous epithelium it will change um, into stratified squamous epithelium and then the person will develop cancer so the second thing yeah, and you know that in the cervix also the metaplasia will take place and this metaplasia it can occur in the bronchi and it can also occur in the urinary tract 
the such tumors they can appear in the skin, in the GIT, in the uterus, in the vagina, in the cervix, in the urinary tract also. Ekenthoma, this is, uh, it means cell nests of pickle cells which are connected by fibrils and they will give the appearance of pearls, you know, like this rose and like this flower. Okay, this uh, like the roses, they will have like they have many layers and they have many petals. Skin cell carcinoma of the esophagus, lungs, cervix, all of these can occur. And then the squamous cell carcinoma of esophagus, in all of these organs, squamous cell carcinoma is more common than the adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is that of the epithelium directly and um, Squamous cell carcinoma, mostly it will appear due to metapastic change in the epithelium. Basal cell carcinoma of the skin, um, it is also called rodent ulcer. So it appears, it develops from the basal cells of the skin, hair, follicle, or even from the sweat glands. It is common in, in the face and around eye, and it is locally invasive. It doesn't metastasize. So if you will look under microscope, then it will have fusiform cells in masses. So cell nest is not there, just clusters of cell. Then the glandular nupasias, uh, they develop from the glands of the mucous membrane, adenocarcinoma, we can see the glands apparently, and then the commonest variety primary tumor is in the fallopian tube, and then it will involve the endometrium. Then adenoacanthoma, these, can, these are cancerous glandular cells and benign squamous cells. Here you will see the cell nests. Then adenosquamous carcinoma, it can also involve the endometrium. Okay. So then in sometimes they uh, like, you know, this carcinoma of the squamous cell, adenocarcinoma of the, can occur in the uh, cervix also. Like 10 to 15%, 10 to 20% cases of the cervical cancer they will have adenocarcinoma. Remaining 80%, they will have uh, they will have squamous cell carcinoma. If you remember yesterday, I told you that uh, uh, 70 to 80%, they will have squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. 15%, they will have adenocarcinoma of the cervix. And then 5%, they can have both adeno and squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. These tumors are radiosensitive and they produce mucin, so they should be differentiated from the other cancers, like if they're occurring in the adenocarcinoma, if it is occurring in the endometrium, then under microscopic examination, it has to be differentiated from the endometrial cancer. So then some tumors, they will appear in the organs, like uh, they can involve the anterior pituitary. In the anterior pituitary, you can see three different types of, uh, of you can see four different types of tumors depending upon the histology and that which tumors they are involving. Like there can be chromophobe adenoma. It means the patient will have high prolactin or they can have hypopituitarism. Craniopharyngioma, this is of embryonic origin. Here also, patient can have high prolactin if there is compression of the stalk. You know that if we will cut the pituitary stalk, then again, there will be too much prolactin. So if this craniopharyngioma is diagnosed in the childhood, the baby will, the child will present with hypopituitarism. If there is tumor of the acidophils, then it will cause excessive secretion of growth hormone and prolactin. And if the tumor has involved the basophils, then it means that there will be too much ACTH, LH, FSH, and TSH. Then another tumor, few chromocytoma. A uh, few chromocytoma, this is very important for you because you will get questions from here. It develops from the chromophene cells which are present in the adrenal medulla, or uh, these are also present as retroperitoneal tissues. You know that in a normal functioning person, adrenal medulla, it will produce catecholamines. So few chromocytomas, 90% are benign, 10% can be malignant, and these are capsulated tumors. So then you can say, uh, few chromocytoma, this is a benign form. And if it develops into neuroblastoma, that is the malignant form. 
So your patient can have glycosuria, too much glucose in the urine. And the basic problem in few chromocytoma will be that your patient will have suddenly very high blood pressure. And this patient will have no history of hypertension, but now suddenly becoming hypertensive. Then the serum level of catecholamines will be very high. What are the catecholamines? Adrenaline, noradrenaline. They will be high in the serum. And if we will test the urine of that patient, we will see high urinary vanillyl mendelic acid. That is also a spear question. In the serum, high catecholamines. And in the urine, high vanillyl mendelic acid. So then how you should treat that? You should remember that 10% of the few chromocytomas, they will be maybe can be malignant 10 percent can be bilateral and the death rate the 10 percent will be bilateral and then if you have to treat them first you will have to give alpha blockers and once the bp is controlled a little bit then you can start beta blockers okay, that is the treatment of your chromocytoma you will not give the beta blockers first because then you cannot control the BP. So initially you will have to give alpha blockers for like prazosine hydrochloride followed by beta blockers. Okay, so that is about the pheochromocytoma. Then what is Kohn's disease? This is adenoma of the adrenal cortex. It will produce endosterone. So what will happen? Endosterone, its function is to keep salt and water in the body. So there will be salt and water re retention. Though if, if we are retaining sodium, then we are passing out potassium. So this patient who has uh, Kohn's disease, they will have low potassium and they will have high salt and water and then they can have metabolic alkalosis also. So this is all, it will also lead to hypertension, hypertension. So we should know about that. Epinephrine, it is produced in Epinephrine, it, can, it, is, it may also be high if your patient has Crohn's disease. Uh, then carcinide tumors. Carcinide tumors, these are also called argentifenoma. They develop from the argentafin cells, which are with high affinity to silver stains and present in the intestinal mucosa. Then we will call them enterochromaffin, or they can involve the Plasiski cells, which will be present in the appendix, and then they can also involve the ileum. So these are the carcinide tumors. Then we can have ovarian teratomas. Ovarian teratomas, you know that they can be um, of two types, benign and malignant. If there is mature teratoma, that is going to be benign. If there is immature teratoma, that is malignant. So they get the malignant tumor will slow very, will grow very slowly and it will produce serotonin and tachykinin. In one person, there can be flushing and um, there can be facial telangiectasia, diarrhea, bronchi, constriction, and the pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary stenosis. So this is about the carcinide tumors. Carcinide tumors, they, if you can see here, they can involve the intestinal mucosa or they can involve the ovarian tissue. So carcinide tumor, think about two areas, intestine or the ovary. In both, serotonin will be very high. Serotonin is associated with carcinide tumors. In bones, as we read before, the commonest type of tumors are the secondary, which are coming from the prostate, breast, thyroid, proximal bones, skull, spine, pelvis, femur, and humerus. And if the tumor is coming from the prostate, then it will be osteosclerotic. But in all of these tumors, um, these cancer cells, they are osteolytic. They are breaking down the bone. They are causing collagen destruction. So calcium and hydroxyproline will be present in the urine. The exception is that if we, your patient has osteosclerotic tumor, then they will not have calcium or hydroxyproline in the urine. So because the prostate cancer, it will not cause breakdown of the bone cells. 
uh, next type of tumors in the uh, colon and the rectum carcinoma. These cancers are common in the right side or the ascending colon. There can be adenocarcinoma or it will be it can spread in an annual fashion. It can cause constriction of the lumen and it will have the signet ring appearance, like the appearance like uh, if you have a ring with a stone. It will spread directly to the through the lymphatics to the mesenteries and later it will spread through the blood also. So hereditary non-polyposis colon uh, cancer. Um, if there is mutation, you know, then it can involve, it can cause cancers in the colon, in the ovarian tissue, and then in the endometrium. So I think in your uh, exam also, there was a question that if the patient has hereditary non-polyploidal colon cancer, then what is the chance that they will have endometrial carcinoma? There is 20 to 60% chance that these patients, they will develop endometrial carcinoma colon most of them they will develop colon cancer and less than one per and one percent chance that they will develop ovarian cancer okay so breast carcinoma regarding breast carcinoma we have to cover it in two conditions breast carcinoma in the non-pregnant and then breast carcinoma in the pregnancy so the, this is the most common cancer in the women lifetime risk of developing cancer is 11 percent in the uk because incidence is one in nine and uh, from which tissue it is arising from the duct epithelium and uh, it can be if dependent on the hormones like estradiol so the most common site is the upper lateral upper and outer quadrant then for the variety of the breast cancers we use the term sum up it means Scarus cancer, this it will have the worst prognosis, and this is the commonest, and it will have spheroid cells in the dense fibrous stroma. It can take the form of adenocarcinoma, then it will have a senior structure. It can be medullary carcinoma of the breast. Here we will see bulky, less invasive tumor, and it will spread through the lymphatics. Sometimes there can be a trophic carcinoma of the breast, and this one will have the best prognosis. Regarding the incidence, one in nine, then you should know that there can be some hereditary syndromes like BRCA1, BRCA2, so they can cause these problems. Mostly, you know, the two types of um, the two genes they can be involved, like there can be transformation on the chromosome 17 only or there can be translocation between chromosome 12 and 13. Okay. Then um, regarding the age, the breast cancer in the non-pregnant, it is low, the risk is very low below 30 years of age. As the age increases, the chance of cancer also increases. Then after menopause, it will plateau, it will not rise, it will not decrease. So the chance of having uh, this cancer, if the woman is not lactating, then the chance is going to be higher. If she has never been pregnant, then again, her chance will increase. And if she has her first child after the age of 35, then again, her chance will increase. So the incidence of the breast cancer is low in multi, um, who are multigravida and who have fed the babies for like some time, like, uh, for each year of breastfeeding, the chance will decrease by 5%. That is, the, that is a rough estimation, okay? Then there can be familial variety of um, breast cancer, like mutations in cases of the BRCA1, which will involve, which the gene is found on chromosome number 17, and BRCA2, which is present on chromosome 13. And they also increase the chance of developing ovarian cancer. So how the uh, breast cancer spreads? It can spread directly. And uh, you know, breast has a variety of tissue. It can uh, in, grow inside any of these tissues, like into the skin, or it can go into the deep fascia, or it can involve the pectoral muscles, both muscles, pectoral is major and minor. Through lymphatics, it can spread to the axillary lymph nodes, 
then it can go to the root of the neck then through the internal memory it can involve go to the other breast and it can go to lower and then it can go to the mediastinum also then through the blood it can go to the lungs and the bones so how you will know the patient will have hyperkalesemia due to microcalcifications in the breast uh, in the uh, tumor tissue prognosis it can be bad or it can be good uh, when you have like uh, these, like I've just talked about, just remember sclerosis adenomedullary atrophic. I have told you that atrophic has the best prognosis, and which one has the worst prognosis? Sclerosis. Sclerosis has the worst prognosis. So then, they can be estrogen receptor positive or they can be estrogen receptor negative. If they are estrogen receptor positive, they are good. You know why? Because when you know the cause, you can treat that. So we can give them estrogen receptor blockers and the patient is going to be fine. Like we can give them Herceptin. You will read about that. So five-year survival rates are 80% if the patient is under the age of 45 and 88% if the patient is like 65 years or older. Regarding management, mostly we have to do surgery. It will depend upon the choice of the woman and the location of the tissue. So mostly mastectomy is done. Before we can, we could do this from lumpectomy. Let's just take out the lump, the loop which is involved. But now the evidence suggests that it is better to take out the whole tissue so that the chance of recurrence will be low. Regarding chemotherapy, doxyrubicin is the drug of choice, but we can give many other drugs also. And sometimes we have to combine it with radiotherapy. So then in the breast, you can see fibroadenosis. This is also cause, called fibrocystic disease of the breast. This is the commonest breast neoplasia. It is benign. Usually it will occur in the third decade of life. And these, uh, you can see multiple lesions. And it is diagnosed by fine needle aspiration. And um, we don't do biopsy, just fine needle aspiration. On the basis of cytology, it can be diagnosed and it can be treated by radiation. You know, when you have this carcinoma of the breast during pregnancy, and they ask you that how you will diagnose that, you should not say fine needle aspiration because that would be wrong answer. In that case, you will have to take a full biopsy, core biopsy or full biopsy under ultrasound guidance. And uh, your diagnosis will depend upon the biopsy, but not on fine needle aspiration, not cytology. That is the point. So, but we will talk about that in detail once we, we will start doing this maternal medicine with the part two people, maybe from the next week, then we will cover all pathology, which is related to the female system. Don't worry about that. Okay. Then your patient can have breast cancer. They will ask you what is the common site of breast cancer. Your answer is base of the bladder. You know the base of the bladder is towards the abdomen and the apex is towards the urethra. It can be papilloma because we have transitional epithelium. And uh, regarding the P, this papilloma is a predisposing factor, then they, there can be schistosomiasis hematobium. Uh, it can also be disposed because it will cause recurrent scarring and inflammation. This is a pro this is a parasite protozoa which can cause uh, repeated scarring and injury to the bladder mucosa. And ultimately, after like 10 years, 15 years, it can cause cancer. Microscopically, we will see transitional epithelium unless it is very anaplastic. Grossly, you will see a polyp. There can be an ulcer or it can have a villus veteran. It also spreads by direct spread and like it can go and involve the ureteric orifices and then from there it can go involve the kidney and it can cause renal failure. Wilms tumor, another name is nephroblastoma. This is a childhood tumor and commonly it will involve one kidney and uh, sometimes it can be extra renal also. But extra renal, it can be very rare and uh, it can even develop from the round ligament, ovary, uterus, cervix, and the testes. They can be involved. Prostate carcinoma. 
So usually this is an adenocarcinoma with abundant fibrous trauma. When the age of peak age of involvement is 60 years. It is dependent upon the hormones like dihydroxytestosterone, and it spreads uh, by through different routes. Direct spread is very rapid, and then it can have a lymphatic spread through the ionic lymph nodes, and then through the blood. And in the later stages, it can involve the bones, and then we have read that it will cause osteosclerotic problems in the bone. All others, they will cause osteolytic problem, but this one will cause, cause hardening of the bone cells. So we will not see any calcium or hydroxychlorine in the urine of that person. And prostate cancer, it will produce acid phosphatase. So we test for prostate-specific antigen. Okay, that is required for the diagnosis of the prostate cancer. And if the level is more than 35, then it means that your patient has prostate cancer. Okay, and then let's talk about the testicular tumors. They can be of many varieties and they will have their specific features. Like patient can have seminoma. Seminoma means that it accounts for 40% of the testicular tumors. This is non-secretory. It is usually involved people between the ages of 30 to 50 and it will develop from spermatocytes. It is very sensitive to radiation, and uh, it, when it becomes malignant, it will invade the tunica albuginea, and then it can also involve the tunica vaginalis. And this is a slowing, slowly growing tumor, and it has good prognosis. So if it is diagnosed early, we can offer orchidectomy, which is removal of the testes. It spreads through the lymphatics. It can involve in gynal lymph node and the paraaortic lymph nodes. There can be, after seminoma, there can be teratomas. Teratomas, they make up 20% of the test for tumors. The age of involvement is 20 to 40 years. Regarding embryonic element, it can be of ectodermal, endodermal, or mesodermal origin. And a trophoplastic element is also seen, but in just 4%. It is more malignant than seminoma, and it secretes alpha fetoprotein, HCG. It can cause gynecomastia, or it can cause virilization, like feminization. Okay. So these are the features of teratoma. Thirdly, we can have sertoliolytic cell tumors, uh, with, which make up less than 1% of the testicular tumors. They will secrete. HCG, they can also cause gynecomastia and they can cause feminization. Remember, I told you before, if sertoliolytic cell it appears in the females, it will cause excessive hair, facial hair growth, and it can cause virilization also. Okay, but in the male, the opposite. Okay, then there can be some uh, other. In hereditary disorders, we talked about them when we were talking about um, genetics. So your patient can have hemosiderosis and hemochromatosis. These are autosomal recessive disease caused by accumulation of hemosiderin in the tissues, and more common. And this is more common in the females than what will happen. Um, total iron binding capacity it will be month third of the normal capacity. What are the causes? Hemolysis, like there is RH incompatibility, then iron overload, so repeated blood transfusions, and these are the causes, okay? Like in cases of sickle cell disease and thalassemia, you know, these patients, they will need repeated uh, blood transfusions. And then if the patient is getting parenteral iron, then a gut absorption, like in cases of Bohr's um, syndrome, low iron in the diet, then the complications of this problem can be due to deposition of hemosiderin in the tissue. So this hem hemosiderin, it can be like it is pigmented tissue, it can be deposited in the liver. So if the iron is deposited, then there will be loss of proper function in that organ. In the liver, it can cause cirrhosis uh, and later it can cause carcinoma. Then it can cause diabetes in the pancreas because when the iron is deposited, then the gland cannot function normally. 
then in the heart it can cause heart failure and cardiomyopathy remember when we were talking about thalassemia i told you that the most common cause of death in the thalassemia is heart failure why because yes it yeah because too yes, much it's a, yeah. yeah too much iron will deposit yes. in the heart accumulation of, of uh, yeah. blood because the heart will be, uh, heart will become hard so it cannot pump the blood effectively if there is too much iron in the kidney it will cause renal failure then this iron can be deposited into the reticulo and endothelial system if it is deposited in the joints it will cause arthritis and it can also cause osteoporosis all of these complications because hemosiderin it will be deposited into the um, joints or into the many tissues it even it can be deposited into the basal ganglia even into the gonads right so that's why uh, if it will be deposited in the gonads your patient can present with infertility okay so the next is wilson's disease in wilson's disease what happens you remember that There can be, this is um, uh, also autosomal recessive disorder. You know, whenever there is problem with the function, you will say that this is autosomal recessive. If there is problem in the structure, those abnormalities are usually autosomal dominant. Okay? So Wilson's disease is autosomal recessive. It is characterized by excessive accumulation of copper in the tissues all over the body. But mostly it will go into the uh, liver, brain, kidneys, and the cornea. In the cornea, it will make like golden, golden gray rings, and we call them Kaiser Flecker pressure rings. They are diagnostic of Wilson's disease. So it can cause, um, there can be hemolysis, and then there can be anemia. Another problem which you can see in the patients that is Rett syndrome. This is a neurodevelopmental disorder. It can affect the infants or the young children. This is X-linked gene mutation. You don't have to remember the name, but it is MECP2. And there can be apraxia or there can be dyspraxia, which means that inability or reduced ability to perform the body of the body to do the motor function. The growth will be normal till the age of six to 18 months. And after that, it is followed by microcephaly, gradual loss of speech, ataxia, cannot walk properly, then loss of purposeful hand movements, then hyperventilation and stereotypic hand washing movements, and uh, then they can have spasticity. And this is rare and the recurrence in the family, same family is less than 1%. That is Red syndrome. There can be neurodevelopmental problem. Then what is an aneurysm? Aneurysm means that there is abnormal dilatation of the blood vessel. It is uh, abnormal. Three, four cases, they will involve the abdominal aorta. And one, fourth cases, they will involve the thoracic aorta. There are different causes, like uh, there can be atheroma development, there can be vascular trauma, or if there can be retinal uh, these uh, aneurysms, they can be anywhere. Like they can be developed into the blood vessels due to trauma. What will happen? The intima will be there left. The only the outer membrane of the blood vessel will be there and the rest of the structure will be destroyed. Then aneurysm can develop. They can develop into the retina because of the diabetes. Then they can develop into the cerebral circulation. Then we call them berries aneurysm. And uh, why aneurysms are dangerous? If you remember Marfan syndrome, they said that there can be aneurysm and then which can um, which can burst during pregnancy. Like uh, there can be aortic dilatation. If the woman has Marfan syndrome and then she, it, if the aortic root is more than 4.5, more than 4 centimeter, then patient can have this rupture in the aneurysm during pregnancy. What is a fatty change? Fatty change in the liver means replacement of the hepatocytes by the fat cells. Mostly this, um, you know, uh, this change mostly occurs in the liver, kidney, heart, and it can lead to the enlargement of these tissues. 
there are different um, causes like chloroform yesterday i told you that it can cause this change and they can give normal deposition of fat into the liver chloroforms toxins anoxia choline obesity alcoholism diabetes mellitus all of these can cause fatty changes and on the liver it is due to starvation or obesity with the normal liver function test then how do we get acute renal failure important for you to know because in obigyne you can come across various uh, conditions which can lead to acute renal failure uh, so most common one which you should expect to see in the obigyne that is acute tubular necrosis abrupt or rapid decline in the renal function so at a serum blood urea nitrogen or the serum creatinine concentration with or without a decrease in the urine output so you are going to see high serum blood and urea nitrogen then you will say that patient is going into the renal failure because what is the function of the kidney function of the kidney is to keep the useful things in the body and to remove the toxic materials from the body or the byproducts from the body so if it it will not do its function then of course serum creatinine or and the branch urea and nitrogen they are going to increase and uh, depending upon the stage there can be decrease or no change in the urine output this condition is often transient and uh, it will it is completely reversible as you know the kidney is large and uh, in cases of acute renal failure if your patient has chronic renal failure then your patient will have small kidney and uh, you will be able to see protein casts which can be seen in the connective tissue and um, they can be seen in the urine also protein cast like in cases of um, nephrotic syndrome so regarding the causes of the acute renal failure so when we are talking about the causes we can say that it was pre-renal pre-renal is always due to low renal perfusion less blood is in the body either there can be hypovolemia or the hemorrhage has occurred that's why less blood is going to the kidney pre-renal okay then the cause can be in the kidneys then we will say that this is renal like in cases of disseminated intravascular coagulation so maybe blood clots are formed in the uh, liver in the kidney also then because of some toxins like mercury and this mercury will affect only the proximal convoluted tubule then the causes can be post renal that is out beyond kidney not in not due to pre renal or renal and there is some other problem like if there is some obstruction to the ureter then the urine cannot go out like maybe there can be a tumor or maybe if there is like uh, accidental ligation of the ureters then all of these can cause a problem obstruction or if there is some stone recurrent stone formation okay so then there are different stages of the renal failure first one is prodrome and then uh, like patient will start having some decrease in the blood urine volume then patient can become oliguric like uh, patient is will be passing like 50 to 400 ml of the urine per day and then serum urea and the creatine they can rise then after that uh, in cases of post oliguric uh, post obstruction they the patient will be oliguric then normalization of the urine volume but not more not for the serum urea and the creatinine patient can have polyuria if there is persistent tubular dysfunction then one fourth of the patients they can die so mercury can cause neuropathy and nephropathy so just briefly you should remember if there is excessive bleeding uh, like in cases of hemorrhage or uh, then what can happen in the body your patient can have acute tubular necrosis and patient will go into renal failure so we need to correct the uh, blood volume immediately otherwise patient can have, because initially the disease will be reversible but later with passage of time it will become irreversible 
sometimes they can ask you what is hematuria hematuria when the patient is passing blood in the urine it can be microscopic it can be macroscopic so if there is microscopic the causes will be different and if it is macroscopic then the cause will be different if the patient has macroscopic hematuria then mostly the cause will be in the bladder either there is injury or some blood vessel has been injured or there is some big stone but something is involving the urethra or the bladder but if you if we have um, microscopic hematuria it can be because of cancer it can be because of the cancer in the kidney or cancer in the bladder or it can be seen in if there is hemolysis also so the among the causes again schistosomia hematobium then incompatible blood transfusion which has led to hemolysis then in cases of sickle cell anemia and then in renal cell carcinoma just remember the main causes if they give you in the exam a woman who is like 50 year or older than 50 years and she has hematuria then they will ask you what should be done now so she should have cystoscopy why cystoscopy to see that she doesn't have any tumor into the bladder that is and, and uh, so that is important to remember only the causes cardiac disease in pregnancy this is very important issue because even in the previous report on maternal mortalities it showed that this is a leading cause of indirect maternal death and um, what are the main causes of the myocardial infarction they can we can divide them into acquired causes and the congenital causes so the leading cause is mostly these are going to be myocardial infarction myocardial infarction also called is ischemic heart disease has led to the myocardial injury and sometimes they can be aortic dissection also regarding the uh, and you know the acquired causes they are causing more cardiac disease in pregnancy than the congenital causes myocardial infarction here would be myocardial necrosis due to abrupt reduction of coronary blood flow mostly due to atherosclerosis and um, it will not it will not cause uh, it will not cause so many complications but in pregnancy mostly there will be non atherosclerotic causes like coronary thrombosis or there can be infections like or there can be aortic dissection infarction is more common uh, in the third trimester and uh, mostly if we will do the ecg we will see that it has involved anterior wall of the left uh, anterior wall of the left ventricle and the left sided coronary artery the chance of maternal death because of the myocardial infarction is 20 percent and then uh, we can diagnose that some changes have taken place like if we will take the biopsy from the cardiac muscle since we are talking about pathology okay. so then you should be able to see um, changes after 24 hours if you will see before then we will not be able to see it at that time so regarding the enzyme levels you are going to see high creatinine phosphokinase level in the up in the body six hours after the suspected myocardial infarction then ldh will also increase but it will occur so the cpk cardiac phosphokinase kinase it will be high elevated after six hours and it will persist for 36 hours ldh it will rise later and uh, it will persist longer but if we have to if we have to diagnose now we use troponin i troponin i that is seen because it will start rising within 20 minutes of the heart attack okay so cardiac troponins that are the most diagnostic as you know cardiac that cardiac troponins they can be of different types and um, but we use they will just give you troponin i or troponin c your answer will be troponin i so it will start rising within 20 minutes and then it will continue to increase and the problem and the good thing is that it is specific to the tissue cardiac tissue 
so that is more diagnostic we will talk about that also in detail once we will go to maternal medicine so cardiac enzymes their levels they will change with myocardial infarction so what are the complications if someone has developed myocardial infarction so we should know that there can be fibrinous pericarditis is that that along with the myocardial infarction there can be injury to the, the there can be fibrinous fibrin deposition into the pericardium the layer which is covering the heart it can be also be seen then there can be dysfunction of the left ventricle and thrombus can form into the left ventricle then sometimes the ventricles they can become enlarged they will have aneurysm so aneurysm means out pouching or out pocketing of the tissue and it doesn't have it is not uh, wall will not be as strong as it was before so in the later stage there can be some further damage to the left ventricle so you should remember it is important to remember that in cases of myocardial infarction you will see ventricular aneurysm it will not be dilatation of the aot arch okay so for the diagnosis you are going to do the ecg and troponin i why troponin i because troponin i is specific of the cardiac tissue troponin i is very specific it is coming only from the cardiac tissue you can use other enzymes also like creatinine kinase and lactate dehydrogenase but these are not very specific they will just give you that some injury is there but troponin i will tell you that uh, injury has occurred into the heart okay another disorder important for you to remember this is cystic fibrosis cystic fibrosis um, sometimes they will write down cystic fibrosis five or six because the uh, most common deletion or the transformations will be seen in the chromosome in the this gene five or six so this is autosomal recessive disorder involving 7q31 and uh, there is change in the uh, transport channels for the chloride and uh, for that change in the cftr genes and there will be which is and you know this gene this is a transmembrane receptor so what will happen uh, we can see that more than 700 types of mutations and commonest one like which is seen in the 70 percent that is deletion of 506 it will affect exocrine glands gastrointestinal tract and mainly the respiratory system it is due to defect in the sodium chloride channels in the epithelial and chloride rich sweat the patient will be passing sweat which will be very rich in the chloride ions screening test is done by several tests like there can be multiple mutation assays then blood spots screening can be there this is also called the three test then detection of the immune reactive serum trypsin it is done diagnostic test is also uh, sweat pilocarpine test we will give pilocarpine and then the patient will sweat a lot and then we will see that there is plenty too much chloride there and then when we will carry out the mutation analysis you are going to see cftr cystic fibrosis trans receptor genes they will be present um, mutations will be seen on the analysis so it is going to involve many tissues and then these patients if the incidence is very high like in the white population the incidence on the carrier rate is 1 in 25 if you have 25 caucasian persons we are going to see that one of them will be positive for this cystic fibrosis the gene mutation when it will involve the parotid glands then you know that uh, it can in, uh, there can be dryness salivary secretions can be less it can also involve the sweat glands it can involve pancreas gallbladder intestine and mucosa it can also involve tracheobronchial tissue it can cause obstructive pulmonary disease why because the patient will produce excessive thick muco mucus secretions which are very hard to pass out and then they can block the respiratory pathways they can involve the pancreas so that's why you know we said trypsin because the digestive enzymes they will be less why because there is already destruction of the pancreas so this is the most common lethal genetic disease in the white population carry rate 
is one in twenty to one in twenty five. Uh, one in 22 some but most of the books they will say one in 25 patient can have infertility why because they will have viscous uh, secretions the males they can have aspermia because they will have congenital bilateral absence of the vast difference that will be the cause of infertility if you will palpate the testes you will not find the vast difference so it can cause miscarriage, it can cause in the female, it can cause meconium ileus, and then it can involve the lung cells and the uterus cells, they will be normal. So mostly these patients, they will have like, um, and mostly what will happen, they will die due to respiratory failure. Because the mucus, they cannot pass out, they will have recurrent respiratory infections, they will be, they always they will be on antibiotics, and a stage will come when they will not be responding to any antibiotics and they will die due to respiratory failure these patients since they don't have any the digestive enzymes like we said that trypsin will be deficient then uh, we have to give them enzymes from outside to digest the substances to digest the food then when the gallbladder is involved they cannot absorb the fat soluble vitamins like vitamin a d K and E. So you will have to give them enzymes from outside so that their metabolism will be normal. That is the point. So then hydronephrosis. What is hydronephrosis? Hydronephrosis means that there is persistent dilatation of the renal pelvis. So there, as you know that there are two parts of the kidney, cortex and the um, medulla and the collecting region of the whole um, all of these ducts from where the ureter will arise that is the pelvis of the kidney so hydronephrosis it means that there is persistent dilatation of the pel junction where the ureter is meeting the pelvis of the kidney well among the causes you should remember cervical carcinoma renal calculi and the posterior urethral valves why posterior urethral valves because the, there will be retrograde flow of the urine so it will be going back and it will cause persistent dilatation of the ureters. Okay. So now going towards the specific conditions. Acute endometritis. Acute endometritis means, as you know, the inner lining of the uterus is, by, is the columnar epithelium. So if that is involved, there is infection, then we call that acute endometritis. It is associated with termination of pregnancy, miscarriage, and postpartum, uh, especially in the presence of retained products of conception. It can be caused by streptococci, by anaerobes, by coliform, typically, and only rarely, very rarely, it will be caused by Staphylococcus aureus. And usually, you will see polymicrobial infection, like infection due to many organisms. So polymorphonuclear cell infiltration involving the endometrial stroma and the glands. Infiltration in the premenstrual endometrium, it will involve the stroma. So acute when the duration is less than two weeks. We will call it chronic endometritis if it persists for more than two weeks. It may occur following acute endometritis, which is associated with termination of pregnancy, miscarriage, or after delivery. It is also associated with insertion of intrauterine contraceptive devices. It, it can be associated with endometrial tuberculosis. You know that the primary TB in the genital tract, it can also take place. So then it is because of the tuberculosis. It is characterized by chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate, and lymphocyte and plasma cells, and fibroblastic and vascular proliferation. So what is endometrial tu tuberculosis? So it is associated with tuberculosis in the cell, in the tubes and uh, which can cause infertility. In premenopausal women, regular shedding of the endometrium it prevents development of the TB and caseation and the chronic endometritis, it may be the only feature. Tuberculosis, they are maximally developed in the late neutral phase of the, cell, of the cycle 
which is the most appropriate time for sampling. So then we should take the endometrium sample, uh, endometrial sampling and we can find that there is TB. Because you know this genital tract TB is very rare, uh, common only in some areas in India and some other countries, but not very common. Now you will see more cases in association with the HIV infection. In postmenopausal women, endometrial shedding, it doesn't occur and caseation, caseation, it will develop. And the uterine cavity, it may become filled with caseous material. So rare, but it, the picture can be very bad. So then in the endometrium, there can be development of the endometrial polyps. There will be focal overgrowth of the endometrium, which will protrude into the uterine cavity. So they may be benign or malignant and they can be sessile or they can have a long pedicle. So they, then they will be pedunculated. The polyps, they are lined by the endometrial epithelium, which is columnar and it will contain endometrial stroma in the glands also. Ulceration of the polyp, it can cause bleeding and pedunculated polyps, they may undergo torsion also because you know they are long, they are sometimes they will hang outside the uterine cavity and uh, they can have distortion okay then they can present with intermenstrual bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding so that's why if you have any patient with postmenopausal bleeding you need to see that what is the origin of the bleeding so when we talk about the female genital system you know that there are going to be two different cycles in the body one is the ovarian cycle and the second one is the endometrial cycle about the ovarian cycle we covered that in the endocrinology right that there, there will be the follicular phase of the cycle and then there will be luteal phase of the cycle so in the follicular phase as you know the follicle will develop under that there will be plenty of fsh and the level of fsh will rise in connection with the uh, estrogen. Estrogen will stimulate production of FSH. Once the follicles have reached the maximum diameter, then uh, you know this there will be LH surge, and this this LH surge it is going to cause ovulation. After ovulation, what will happen? Then there will be luteal phase of the cycle. In the luteal phase, there will be a formation of the carpus luteum and body will be preparing for the, uh, in the anticipation of the pregnancy. Second, and if pregnancy occurs, then it will continue and uh, carpus luteum will be maintained. Carpus luteum will be maintained by ECG. And if pregnancy doesn't occur, then there will be drop in the level of the progesterone and your patient will have menstruation. That is the ovarian cycle. Now the second cycle is in the endometrium. So endometrial cycle, it has a proliferative phase and it has a luteal phase. So in the uh, proliferative phase, uh, it will develop, there will be development of the endometrium under the influence of estrogen. So the straight narrow glands there which are present, in, uh, they will be formed and then they will have a compact stroma. Then mitotic figures will be seen in the glands and the endometrial stroma. The luteal phase, it is, you know, this um, proliferative phase, it is under the effect of estrogen. Luteal phase, it is under the effect of estrogen, progesterone, and it will bring secretory changes into the endometrium. There will be appearance of subnuclear glycogen containing vacuoles which later disappear and the nuclei they will return to the basal position. Glands will become dilated the, before in the proliferative phase they were straight okay. Now they will become dilated, tortuous and secretions they will appear within their lumen and uh, stroma will become edematous. And the spiral arteries, they will become dilated and they will become tortuous also. So the next phase is menstrual phase. In menstrual phase, there is rapid fall in estrogen and the progesterone level. So both hormones, their level will drop and then there will be rapid regression of the stromal edema and decreased thickness of the endometrium. 
and vasospasm in spinal arteries with necrosis. There will be hemorrhage and shedding of the compact and the spongy layer and the basal layer, it will remain and then it will regenerate. Also, as we question that which part of the endometrium is shed during menstruation. So the basal layer, it will be left there inside the uterus and they will the compact the spongy layers they will be shed during menstruation if there is a, a patient who is taking combined oral contraceptive pills then what changes can be seen we will see that uh, endometrial glands they are undergoing atrophy and there will be very few and then there will be few inactive glands and we will see compact stroma with very different different degrees of the decidual like changes slight decidual changes like all of these changes i have mentioned and the compact stroma so basically in the common words we can say that cocps they are going to cause suppression of the uh, growth of the endometrial lining so they will cause thinning of the endometrial lining okay so if your patient is taking IUCD, then what is the effect on the endometrium? So there will be infiltration of the endometrium with mononuclear cells. Then polymorph near the surface, which is irregular. Surface will be irregular, and then you will see polymorph, polymorphonuclear cells. Then you can see foci of hemorrhage and squamous metaplasia can be present, and then there can be cyclical changes which will persist. Like you're going to see a polyphyry phase, and you are going to see a luteal phase. If there is myrena, myrena, you know, it is containing what? It is containing levonorgestrel LNG, levonorgestrel. Okay, so this is a progesterone. So there will be progesterogenic effects, including decidual changes and inactive or weakly secretory glands with thinning of the endometrial lining. That's why we use Marina if the patient has heavy menstrual bleeding. What is the area stellar reaction? This is secondary to a direct effect of progesterone on the endometrium. Endometrial epithelial cells, they become increasingly evacuated and then they are thrown into the pseudopapillary pores and they will give the appearance of a hypersecretory type. So there is evidence of decidualization around spiral arteries and under the surface of the epithelium. Complete decidualization how, is however, it is not seen until pregnancy is well established. So the cell nuclei, they are pleomorphic and there is glandular hyperplasia, intranuclear cytoplasmic invaginations, which may resemble viral inclusions. The area stellus, they occur in normal intrauterine pregnancy. And you can also see them, this reaction can be seen in after ectopic pregnancy. Then even after progesterone therapy and can also occur in the endocell. It's important for you to know that it is not occurring only under the effect of pregnancy, but in other conditions also you can see them. The presence of chorionic villi on the endometrial curatings, it provides conclusive evidence of the intrauterine pregnancy. So the presence of chorionic villi is very important for the diagnosis of pregnancy. So anytime a patient is becoming pregnant and then whatever is the outcome of the pregnancy we like to do the histopathology basically why because we want to see that actually the other patient had pregnancy and there was no other abnormality okay let's talk about the ovarian cysts ovarian cysts in the in the women they can be of different types and uh, they can be functional or they can be pathological. What are the different types of functional ovarian cysts? The most common type of cysts are going to be ovarian carpus luteum cyst. So typically, they will be unilateral. They are more common in pregnancy, and usually they will contain clear fluid, and they are lined by luteinized granulosa and the theca cells. Cold blood is typical of the endometriotic cysts. Then ovarian follicular cysts. 
simple cells, these are lined by flattened granulosa cells. They secrete estrogen, which may be sufficient to inhibit gonadotrophin secretion, and they are associated with an ovulatory cycles and endometrial hyperplasia. So usually I will tell you one thing. What are the functional ovarian cysts? You know, if, uh, if one follicle will burst and it will release the follicle, it will heal and it will form corpus luteum. But as you know, uh, in each cycle, many follicles, they are recruited and they will undergo development. That is the way, right? So these follicles, all of them are not going to burst or open up. Uh, so what will happen? They are growing under the effect of estrogen and then they didn't become the dominant follicles because in each cycle, there is going to be one dominant follicle. And once the egg, is, egg will come from one ovary, and then in the next cycle, it is supposed to come from the second ovary. So that is why uh, when unruptured follicles are there, they can develop into the uh, functional cysts. Okay? So we can call them ovarian follicular cysts. So they are benign. That is the point. So usually the functional cyst, if, if you were diagnosed functional cyst, you don't have to treat that. Why? Because mostly within three, four months, due to the effect of the hormones, uh, they will dissolve. If they are persisting, they are not going away, then you can give the combined oral contraceptive pills to your patients, and then these functional cysts, they can be treated. Okay. You, are, you know about polycystic ovary syndrome. Here you are going to see multiple ovarian follicles, which will be less than 10 millimeter in the diameter, and there will be thickening of the ovarian capsule and the volume of the ovaries will also increase to more than 10 milli cubic millimeter. And there can be stromal hyperplasia with luteinization of the theca cells. This change you are going to see in polycystic ovary. And um, multiple follicles, because there will be no dominant follicle. So you are going to see many follicles, can be 12 follicles, 18 follicles in a cycle, but all of them will be less than 10 millimeter. So, you know, follicle will be mature once it reaches the size between 18 to 20, 22 millimeters. Below that, that is useless because it will not mature, it will not release the egg, and then conception will not occur. Other type of functional cysts, they can be theca lutein cysts. These are simple cysts lined by luteinized granulosa cells. And they will develop secondary to excessive gonadotrophin stimulation of the ovaries. And um, they can develop oh, under the effect of like uh, ovulation inducing drugs also in molar pregnancy. You know that in molar pregnancy, there can be large theca lutein cysts. PCOS is associated with follicular cysts. Okay, then as we mentioned before that some and breast and ovarian cancers, they can be associated with different genes. What type of genes? Like BRCA1 and BRCA2. These are the most common causes of the hereditary tumors. So they make up like 5 to 10 percent of the ovarian and the breast cancers. They are due to autosomal dominant hereditary syndromes. However, because there are these are relatively common in malignancies, the association of these tumors in many families, it will be a chance egg occurrence. Like 10%, 10 of the cancers, they will be due to hereditary syndromes and all other cancers, they will develop as a new development. BRCA1 gene, it is thought to be a tumor suppressor gene, which is present on 17Q21. So in a normal person who doesn't have any mutation, its function is to suppress the uh, growth of the a tissue so this is a tumor suppressor gene so the chance of carriers being a carrier in the general population is one in 800 but kavan in this germline mutation it, it is responsible for 90 percent of hereditary ovarian cancers and 50 percent of the hereditary breast cancers and if we take the cumulative risk of developing breast cancer by the age of 70 years, then in cases of BRCA1, it is 80 to 90 percent chance that they will develop breast cancer once they reach the age of 70 years. And then the risk of developing ovarian cancer, it is between 30 to 60 percent. 
this is the overall collective risk okay then the relative risk of breast cancer rises in the women in their 20s and the risk of the ovarian cancer it will not rise until they will reach the mid 30s and the risk of developing breast cancer by the age of 50 is 50 percent in becca one and the carriers and compared to the two percent for the general population 64 percent risk of developing a tumor in the other breast also in the so they can have bilateral tumors 64 percent Regarding the histological features and prognosis of ovarian cancer in BRCA1 carrier, uh, it doesn't differ from the other sporadic cancers. Like anyone who doesn't have this familial cancer, and then uh, the one who has this genetic mutation, they, their risk is the same. By the age of 70 years, BRCA1 mutations, they are associated with a four-fold increase in the risk of colon cancer in the men and then in the, in the woman. And, a threefold increase in the risk of prostate cancer in the males. And uh, but you should re remember that BRCA1 it is not associated with increased chance of breast cancer in the male. Second most common uh, mutation can be in the BRCA2. So the gene is located on 13q12. Then it is thought to be responsible for 40% of hereditary breast cancers and 5 to 10% of the hereditary ovarian cancers. Risk of developing breast cancer increases by age of 70 years and it is 80 to 90%, and the risk of developing ovarian cancer is just 10%. BRCA2 mutations they are associated with a 7% lifetime risk of breast cancer in the males. So the histological features and prognosis of ovarian cancer in BRCA2 carriers, it is the same as in ovarian cancer due to any other cause. So the, if we talk about the most common tumors in the uh, ovaries, you should remember that we can have epithelial ovarian tumors and non-epithelial. And epithelial ovarian tumors, they are more common than the non-epithelial tumors. So when we talk about the non-epithelial tumors, we can get two types of tumors, germ cell uh, tumors, and then we can get the sex card tumors. So regarding germ cell tumors, you should remember that they make up 15 to 20% of primary ovarian tumors. They may be benign like mature teratoma, gonadoblastoma, or they can be malignant. This germinoma that uh, looks like this one. So it is analogous to the seminoma in the males. This is a commonest malignant germ cell tumor in the females, which will occur in the young women between the ages of 13 to 30 years. 10 to 15% are bilateral and solid tumors, which typically present with abdominal mass, or they can have pressure symptoms, like if your patient has to pass urine again and again, and then they can have constipation or they can have pain. So lymphatic spread to the paraaortic nodes that is more common than the surface intraperitoneal metastasis. These tumors are very radiosensitive. They do not have any reliable serum marker and they are associated with gonadal dysgenesis and karyotype is recommended, especially if the woman is a minor. So then we need to see that what is happening like that. Okay. Then second type of tumors, they can be endodermal sinus tumors. So these are rapidly growing germ cell tumors and they typically produce alpha fetoprotein and they will occur in younger women. So they, they can be bilateral tumors, uh, which are less, like 10% can be, maybe 5%, but spread to the other ovary is common. But it, if it, there is tumor in one ovary, it can involve the second ovary also. Intraperitoneal spread is more common than the lymphatic spread. Then your patient can have teratomas. Teratomas, they result from the differentiation of the germ cell tumor into the embryonic tissues. So mature teratoma, this is also called a dermoid cyst. And tissues, they are microscopically similar to those seen in the adult tissue. They are benign, most of them are cystic, and the mature cystic teratoma or the dermoid cyst, they account for 15 to 20% of all ovarian neoplasm. So then, and they can have a large, they can be large in size, they can have thick walls, and they will be cystic in structure, and they can have the hair and the sebaceous material because the mature teratoma is going to get tissue from all three germ layers. 
They are typically lined by stratified squamous epithelium and they may contain teeth, cartilage, thyroid tissue, or respiratory epithelium. Malignant change, it will be predominant in 1% of dermatitis, and this is usually a squamous cell carcinoma. Then we can have immature teratoma. Immature teratomas, they make up 5% of all teratomas. They contain immature tissue of either ectodermal, mesodermal, or endodermal origin with immature neural tissues, and they being the most common type. Then only germ cell tumor for which the histological grade is of the prognostic significance because it depends that what type of tissue it has, then you can say that what are the chances of survival of this patient. And uh, in 10 to 15 percent of the cases, that uh, immature teratoma can be bilateral. Next type of germ cell tumor, ovarian choriocarcinoma. So usually they are secondary from uh, any tumor in the uterus. And then primary ovarian choriocarcinoma is rare, but it may develop from the germ cells. So choriocarcinoma, this will be a solid tumor. Typically, it will be unilateral with cytotrophoblast and sensitive trophoblast on histological examination. And uh, choriocarcinomas, they will produce hemochorionic gonadotrophin. So, all of these are types of which tumor? Germ cell tumor. Some of them have tumor markers, some of them they don't have any tumor markers. So you should be able to identify the, them with the help of tumor markers. Sex cord stromal tumors, um, the most common that you see in the gyne, that is the granulosa cell tumor. Okay. So it makes up 2% of the first of all, remember, this is a sex cord tumor. Okay. These are not like germ cell tumors. Previously, we have read about the germ cell tumors. And now we are talking about the stromal card tumors. Granulosa cell tumors, they make up 2% of all ovarian tumors. 5% they will occur in the prepubertal girls and the 50% they will occur in postmenopausal women. They produce estrogen. They, are, they can present with isosexual precocious puberty, menorrhagia, and irregular bleeding. Isosexual means that, um, you know, when the puberty is occurring, we expect that first there will be growth spurt, then there will be development of the breast, and uh, then there will be development of the hair, and then finally there will be um, menses, okay? So in the granulosa cell tumor, you are going to see the isosexual pattern. In some other, uh, if it is not isosexual, then the sequence of events can be different. Like they don't have to follow the normal stages of development. So granulosa cell tumors, they will present with isosexual precocious puberty. Patient, they can have menorrhagia, irregular bleeding, and postmenopausal bleeding or acute abdominal pain because of their tendency to rupture. They can grow suddenly and they can cause, they can rupture. They are associated with endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma. And 80 to 85 to 90 percent, they will present with stage one disease. Serum inhibin is a clinically useful market if it is elevated. So, but this is not specific. Sometimes you will find nothing at all. Histologically, it is characterized by the presence of call excellent bodies. Call excellent bodies, these are like. Uh, in the exam, they will tell you that they have seen core external bodies. They can ask you that what are core external bodies. These are rosettes, like small flowers, um, which are due to arrangement of the cells around an eosinophilic void space. They will be pink, homogeneous background, and then small clusters of the cells. Okay. Second type of the sex cord tumor can be thicoma or fibroma. These are solid lobulated tumors that may be associated with Meigs syndrome. Meigs syndrome, you know, means pelvic mass, ascites, and pleural effusion, usually on the left side. Tacomas may be hormonally active and produce estrogen with a presentation similar to that described for the granulosa cell tumors, and they are less likely to rupture. Fibromas, which are having like more than three mitosis per 10 high power field, they are considered fibrosarcomas. If the number of mitotic figures is higher than 
three, then they will become cancerous. Then we will call them fibrosarcoma. Then regarding the sex card tumors, we can have Sertoli, we can have Sertoli lady cell tumors. Uh, now we have just read about the male system, so let's go over them. That's what will happen if we have these tumors. These are solid cystic tumors that usually present in the teenage or in the early 30s, and they may produce androgens like androblastomas with amenorrhea, and they can cause virilization. Sex scar tumors, they may be associated with puce jagger syndrome. Like uh, in the puce jagger syndrome, you are going to see orocutaneous pigmentation with the GI polyps, that is puce jagger syndrome. These ovarian tumors, they are usually benign. And leading cell tumors, which are the higher cell tumors, they are small benign androgen secreting tumors and that present in the postmenopausal woman. But the leading cell tumors, as you know, that they are associated with a very high chance of, they, they will call, uh, we just read, they will cause virilization and excessive hair growth. Okay. So the next topic, miscarriage and ectopic pregnancy. So the diagnosis of miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, and molar pregnancy, they are based on the clinical history, examination, and use of the transvaginal ultrasound. And then we can test the urine or the serum beta ICG. If we carry out the ultrasound in the first trimester, we should know that gestational sac is the first pregnancy structure that can be detected. Usually it is visualized as 31 days or we can say at four weeks and three four weeks and three days from the last menstrual period if we are using transvaginal scan and they will measure this gestational sac it will measure like two to three millimeter in diameter so the gestational sac it is detected by trans abdominal scan at five weeks and three days uh, sometimes in the questions they will ask you that what is the first structure that can be seen and how you will see that I mean, you will be seeing that on the transvaginal ultrasound or you will see that on the abdominal ultrasound. So you should remember that on the transvaginal, you can see four weeks and three days. And on the abdominal scan, you can see at five weeks and three days. So typically, they will be located um, centrally within the fundus. And the gestational sac, it grows by one millimeter per day in diameter at this stage, and it becomes elliptical, like oval in shape, and the diameter will be more than 10 millimeter. The transonic area of the gestation sac is composed of two fluid filled cavities, the inner one, which is the amniotic cavity, and the outer one, which is the chorionic or the exocerumic cavity. In early pregnancy, the, chorionis, um, the chorionic cavity, it will be larger. After eight weeks, the amniotic cavity, it expands rapidly to occupy most of the gestation sac. By the end of the first trimester, the amniotic and the chorionic membranes, they fuse and the chorionic cavity is closed. That's why the then amnion and chorion, they will be fused. They will look fused, but actually they will be separate. But the cavity between them will be very small. So the diameters of gestation sac, it should be measured in three planes. Um, like from the inner edges of the trophoblast and the volume should be calculated from the volume of an ellipt elliptical shape. Like you, you will take three diameters from side to side, from up and down, and then oblique diameter. So at least you will take three diameters, then you can calculate these uh, uh, volume or the diameter. So gestation age, it should be estimated using mean sac diameter or sac volume. Once the embryo is identified, then you will use the crown rump length. Before that, you will use the diameter of the sac or the volume. So then once the embryo has developed, then you will take the crown rump length of the embryo. So at six weeks gestation, mean sac diameter will be 16 millimeter, but the average is six to 26 millimeter. If you are doing a transvaginal ultrasound, then what landmarkers you should be able to see? At five weeks and one day to five weeks plus five weeks, the yolk sac, it should be detectable in the chorionic cavity and it should be detected in all viable pregnancies with a mean sac diameter of more than 12 millimeter. At five plus two to six weeks, the embryonic pole, 
it is detectable at two to four millimeter with cardiac activity. So at six weeks, you should be able to see the embryo and the cardiac pulsations. Embryo is usually detectable with mean sac diameter of more than 18 millimeter. At six plus one to six plus six weeks, the embryo is kidney shaped and the crown rump length is four to 10 millimeter. Between seven to seven weeks and six days, the crown rump length is 11 to 16 millimeter. At nine to 10 weeks, the crown rump length is 23 to 32 millimeter and the embryonic heart rate peaks at 170 to 180 beats per minute. The yolk sac, it is the first detectable on transvaginal scan at 35 days from the LMP and it will be three to four millimeter in diameter. It can reach maximum diameter at 10 weeks, which will be six millimeter. Then it will be compressed against the wall of the chorionic cavity by the expanding amniotic cavity and it should not be detected after 12 weeks. Otherwise also what is the sole, what is the purpose of yolk sac? Yolk sac will provide energy for the developing embryo. Then the embryo it should be detectable at 37 days from the LMP by transvaginal scan as a bright linear echo which will be adjacent to the yolk sac. If the CRL is two millimeter, then cardiac activity can be identified. So embryo will grow at a rate of one millimeter per day. You remember before when the sac was there, sac also grows at a rate of one millimeter per day. So the biological variability of the CRL is small and the growth is rapid. So that's why this is the, the most accurate ultrasound estimate of the gestational age when you are taking the CRL. So that is more reliable in the early part. In multiple pregnancies, the larger CRL should be used for assigning the gestational age because maybe the second baby is uh, suffering from something right from the start. I have all viable embryos with CRL of more than seven millimeters. They should demonstrate cardiac activity. In asymptomatic women, the risk of miscarriage is 12% when an empty sac is identified by ultrasound. It is 7.2% the risk of miscarriage when the CRL is less than 5 mm. So you don't have to remember all of this. Just remember um, that the overall chance of miscarriage is 15 to 20%. And they will not ask you this much detail. And once the heartbeat is detected, then the chance of having uh, uh, this one uh, miscarriage is just 0.5 percent okay when the heartbeat is there and crl is more than 10 millimeter embryonic heart rate in increases between week six to nine and which is followed by a slight decline after 10 weeks and late onset of cardiac activity and decreased heart rate in the first time it minister this is associated with high risk of miscarriage LCG assay is important. Yesterday I showed you a picture. I will put that picture here also that how the hormones they will change during pregnancy. HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, as you know, this is a glycoprotein which is composed of two subunits, alpha and beta, which are held together by charge and hydrophobic interactions. The oligosaccharide chains, they account for 35% of the molecular weight and the combination of multiple subunits and multiple N linked to and the O linked oligosaccharide chains, they cause significant heterogeneity in the HCG structure. HCG pre subunits, degraded molecules, and molecules with irregular N and O linked oligosaccharide side chains and fragments, they are all present in the serum urine and other body fluids during pregnancy. So in addition to main HCG, you can see four other variants and uh, they can be called like as hyperglycosylated HCG and then nicked HCG, HCG missing and the beta subunit. We are concerned with the beta subunit. Okay, don't have to remember the detail. We are just concerned with the beta subunit because that is specific to the pregnancy. The same variants plus beta core fragments, they are detected in the urine. 
The molecular weight of the HCG, it ranges between from 9,500 to 40,000. And a urine HCG test is positive when the concentration is more than 20 international units per kiloliter. All HCG tests, they use at least one antibody, which is directed against the beta subunit. So the commonly, the test, they use antibody to one side on the core of the beta subunit. A second antibody is then directed to an alternate site on the HCG molecule. Because of the variation in the antibody combination, different commercial HCG tests, they may use very different mixer of HCG related molecules. So, you know, uh, that's why uh, you must have noticed that on the pregnancy test strip, there are two lines, okay? And they will, they will carry two different types of antibodies. Then, why two different types of antibodies because the two different tests which are combined on a strip so if just one one line is positive like one line turns deeper in color uh, we will say that test is negative but if both lines they become red then we will say that the test is positive that is the point so in the next topic is very lengthy and uh, i think we will not do it today like uh, this is about the abnormal uterine bleeding. So when we will talk about the menstrual disorders, then I will tell you about that. Okay, so I think we can stop here.